All right, so uh, let me begin here. What, 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 four people, yeah, enough. Um, so um, come on. So last, uh, the last class, if you want to call it that, I talked about some, you know, kind of sneaky methods for determining additional zeros of a polynomial, right? Uh, but to me, uh, rational roots theorem or Descartes' rule of signs, these are kind of weapons of like last resort uh, for me. Like I have, I don't know if I've ever used Descartes' rule of signs. Now maybe that's just because of the kind of work I've done. I don't know. Some people you know, use that more, but um, I would say you're probably safe for the next test not knowing Descartes' rule of signs, all right? I just thought I should mention it because I think it's interesting. Um, rational roots theorem, you know, I'd like you to know the statement of it, but you do get a sheet of notes, right? So you can write it down with an example, then you should probably be good to go on that, right? It's not a big deal. Um, but of course, um, the larger thing that you really are responsible for is just factoring, right? need to be ready, willing, and able to like complete the square and you know tackle the usual kind of factoring problems we come across, right? So um, I think now is a good time to just kind of take a, re take a step back and recap like what is, a, what is the factoring of a polynomial look like in general? All right, so let me just take a couple minutes just to write down what does it look like in general? So. So we're going to say it's a polynomial of degree n um, with real coefficients. All right. If that's the case, you can write f of x as what? Well, p of x. So we can write p of x as equal to a product of linear factors possibly repeated. All right? Times a product of quadratic well, to be more specific, irreducible or prime quadratic factors. Again, possibly repeated. There's what it is in words. It's like a product of a bunch of linear factors, this product of a bunch of quadratic factors. Now, I can, you know, specifically, so you got some leading coefficient, I'll call it A, and then you can write like x minus r1 to the m1 power, x minus r2 to the m2 power, x minus rs to the ms power. Those are your linear factors, right? But there's more, right? What else is there? There's quadratic factors, right? You also have things like, I'll say x minus alpha squared <coughs> plus beta squared to the, let's say, n1 power all the way on to, um, and that was alpha 1 and beta 1. X minus alpha, uh, I need another letter. I've used S, I've used M, i used N. How about P? Alpha sub P squared plus beta sub P squared to the N sub P power. Any uh, 
polynomial with real coefficients. We could find a factorization like that. Um, well, see, that's we can find, right? That, those are the, those are the, I mean, that's debatable. Even for a professional mathematician with decades of experience, that's debatable. Because it can be that the zeros are like only, fi you can only find them with like a numerical method or something like that kind of root finder thing I talked about at the end of the last, last talk. But in principle, we could find something like that. Now, how, does, how, do the, how do the numbers, if the degree is n, how do these numbers m1, m2, ms, n1, and np work? How do those add up to n? m1 plus m2, m sub s. That's the degree of the, of the linear factors, all right? And then each quadratic factor, how many do you get? Like if, if, um, if n1 was 1, we'd get 2 degrees worth of x's here, right? If n1 was 2, you'd get 4, it would be a quartic. If n1 is 3, this would be like, you know, sixth order. So any of these, we need twice that whatever index appears here to account for the degree that comes from this factor. So I need plus 2n, 2np. And so there it is. Now, um, I mean, that's, that's the general story. This is, this, is, this is it. This is what a polynomial factor is to. But of course, actually finding the numbers for a specific problem requires work, right? So my question to you, though, is now that we know the factor theorem, right? What's the factor theorem say? It says p of a constant is equal to 0 if and only if what? x minus c is factor of p of x, right? So, and I'm assuming something here, right? I, I want to assume that those products are distinct. So what I'm saying is like R1 is not equal to R2, you know. I've gra I gathered together all of the roots which are the same into one factor. And the same for the quadratic pieces. Like I'm assuming that I've grouped together everything that's the same to make this interesting. So what are the solutions? If I look at P of X equal to zero, what are the solutions if that's what we found? Where do, the, where do the zeros come from? They just come from the linear factors, right? So if we set p of x equal to 0, the answers would be um, we could basically set c equal to either r1 or r2 all the way out to rs. That would be it. And we don't get any zeros from these, right? These are irreducible, OK? Because when you complete the square, you get a square plus a number squared. And you set this equal to 0, you can't get 0, right? So um, the factor theorem and this above result shows you that you have, at most, we have, let's say it this way, we get S real solutions for, for P of X equals to zero as above. And that's it. Now, the next thing we should talk about is, well, okay, so what if you're interested in also allowing for complex solutions, right? If we allow ourselves complex numbers, how does this story change? Like the real number stuff stays the same, right? But if we can work with complex numbers, if we can work with like, you know, square root of minus one, then that allows us to split the last pieces, like these guys, each one of these, we can split as follows, x minus alpha squared, plus beta squared is x minus alpha plus i beta times x minus alpha minus i beta. And I can do that for each one of the complex factors. And I, lo I lost you. So what's beta squared equal to? What's that? Yeah, I mean, how, well, how did I factor like I just did? What was the idea? So 
So I can rewrite beta squared as minus I beta parentheses. Uh, I can't write up there worth anything. I'm sorry, guys. Let's try again. So first of all, I can rewrite that as the difference of squares if I have the imaginary number I to work with. See, because I squared is minus 1, which of course is, that's the new thing with complex numbers, right? That's what we don't have with real numbers. We don't, there's no square of a real number which gives you a negative number, right? But the complex numbers have an imaginary I which does this, and that's the new algebra. And because of that, I can rewrite this as a difference of squares, and I can factor again. <laughs> X minus alpha, you know, minus I beta, if you like, times X minus alpha plus I beta. So all of these irreducible factors with respect to the real numbers become reducible with respect to the complex numbers, right? And so... You know, we get S real solutions, right? But if we also allow complex solutions, we get what? And what? Um, did I say, well, I, I said S real solutions, but um, if, I, if I count repeats, if I, if, if I suppose M1 was like three, then in my current counting, I would just say that there's one solution, right? But if, suppose if I have like one if I have an x minus 1 cubed equal to 0, if I wanted to say that that's the solution 1 3 times, then instead of just putting s here, I should put, um, well, it's complicated, but basically it's m1 plus m2 plus da 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 plus m sub s solutions. And then usually people say something like possibly repeated or including repeats rather. And likewise, um, if you include repeats for the complex solutions, you get, you know, N1 plus, uh, um, well, 2N1 plus 2N2, oh man, plus 2NP uh, complex solutions. See, because each one of these quadratic factors gives us what? It doesn't give us just one factor, it gives us two linear factors. Each one of those by the factor theorem gives you a separate complex solution. So if you put this all together, you have this many real solutions, you have this many complex solutions, including repeats. How many solutions is that in total? It's this many. This number right here. And I got distracted mid-thought there, and I forget, that's just a... What is that? Look at that. Where M1 plus M2 plus da da plus MS plus 2 and 1 plus da 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 plus 2 NP, what? <laughs> End of sentence? Come on, guys. You should say, hey, what do you mean? What am I missing there? What's that equal to? Ah, curses. It's chalk. It's coming apart. Not zero, no, no. This is the total degree of P, right? So I called that, I called that N up here. So this should be equal to N. But my point, I would point out to you that it's also equal to the number of real and complex solutions. In other words, if we have an nth order polynomial equation and we allow for complex solutions and count repeats, then an nth order polynomial equation has N solutions. This is called the fundamental theorem of algebra. Fundamental theorem of algebra. P of x equals to zero has n solutions. Is that, that's the fundamental theorem of algebra. Where under, we, with the understanding that the n solutions counts repeats and it counts complex solutions as well. 
Now, if you don't allow complex solutions, this story is rather complicated because you have to account for how many irreducible quadratics you have. Every irreducible quadratic you have in the factorization is a couple solutions that you lose from the possibility of, you know, solutions. But that's it. This is your life as a polynomial with real coefficients. Let's look at examples, yeah? Now, ordinarily, I would leave this on one board and then I would do examples in another and keep coming back to the, <laughs> the nomenclature here and expanding on it, but this pedagogy has is forbidden me in this classroom unless I use that board, but I'm reluctant to clean it again because I feel like I've already added a permanent smudging to this board from my earlier work this semester. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'm going to focus on quadratic examples for a couple because I think there are people here who are rusty on completing the square and need to see it again, right? So let's do that. So x squared plus um, 16x plus, let's say, 17. All right. So to complete the square, I take half of this coefficient, right? And I group it into the square. So what's half of a 16? Eight. Now, to be fair, I have to subtract the square of that. All right, so I have to subtract 64. And of course, the 17 is still there. So what does that give us? What's uh, 64 minus 17? All right. So do we need complex numbers to factor this? Nope. No, we don't. But do we need ugly real numbers? Yes. Yes, we do. I mean, <laughs> you need the square root of 47, right? So you use your imagination and rewrite this, of course, as what? The square root of 47 squared, and then that gives us x plus 8 minus the square root of 47, x plus 8 plus the root 47. So at this point, we've done what? We have factored completely f of x over the reals, right? You're like, what's f of x? It's a good question. It's what I should have named this. There. Now I have named names. What if I wanted to solve f of x equal to 0? What would the solution to that be? By the way, f of x equal to 0 has solutions. x equals 2. I can read it off from that. Minus 8 plus or minus root 47. By the factor theorem, right? And remember that the factor and the zero correspond by a minus, right? So if I've got x minus c, then f of c equals to zero. That's why I've got a minus eight there, because I've got a plus eight over here in the factor, right? Example one. Example two. What happens if we put x squared plus 16x plus like, oh, I don't know, 66? So 
So almost the same completing the square, except what's the difference? x plus 8 squared minus 64, right? Plus 66, what's that give us? Yeah, plus 2, right? So when we get plus 2, you can identify this in terms of my previous board as like alpha equals to minus 8, beta equals to the square root of 2 in the language I was using in my general setup. Right? So we just look at 2 and think of it as minus 2i squared, minus square root of 2i squared, right? So instead of putting a 2 there, I think about this as like minus um, i times the square root of 2 squared. Now you don't have to write that down. I'm just, I'm writing that down to emphasize the logic here. But I don't usually write that down. I usually just go straight to what I'm about to write. And there you go. Now we have factored f of x completely over the complex numbers. So on your like, you know, your next test, and if I ask you to factor a polynomial completely, since we're working both over the reals and the complexes, depending on which section we're in, right? I need to tell you which number system I intend, otherwise it's just unfriendly, right? So on the test, if I say factor completely, and I forget to put over the reals or over the complexes, you should ask me. You say, hey, you said that you'd tell us, <laughs> and I should tell you, all right? Because otherwise it's ambiguous, right? And what's the solution? By the way, f of x equals 0 has what solutions? Minus 8, right? Plus or minus i times the square root of 2. What do you get if you try the quadratic formula here? You get what I just boxed in both cases. Right? So when you complete the square, you become the quadratic formula. But I, th I would argue it's better than the quadratic formula because if you're careful, there's like a lot of redundancy in the arithmetic and you, it allows you to sort of check yourself as you go. If you just use the quadratic formula in one foul soup, there's so many opportunities for making arithmetic mistakes in the squaring and the square rooting and the order of operations and so forth. This, if you multiply it back out, you can see if you got it right. There's some, there's some ways to check yourself here. Anyway, you know, you might ask, can I use the quadratic formula to get to the same answers? Like, could I use the quadratic formula to reverse engineer these factorizations in view of the factor theorem? Would that be an acceptable way to do things in here? Yes, sure. If you want to do it that way, go for it. I'm fine with that. Uh, it would be very hypocritical on my part to, like, forbid that solution because that's how I did things until I was in differential equations and learned better, you know? I'm just, I mean, when I finally realized that completing the square is actually easier and faster than the quadratic formula, then my viewpoint changed. But it, no one, no teacher ever convinced me of that. I had to convince myself of it. So. It's probably just because I wasn't listening. But um, I don't know. In fairness to my algebra teacher, I would usually ask, could we, could we do blah, 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 blah? And I would always get the following answer. Well, James, you can do it that way if you want but we're going to do it this way. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> also, um, I, took, I took trigonometry with this, uh, this lady. She was great. She, her first day of class, she was like, I've been teaching in public schools, public high school for 20 years, chasing students down in the hallways. I'm tired of it. I want to know more of it. You want to come to my class? Come to my class. If you don't want to come to my class, don't come to my class. I don't care. If you don't do a homework, I don't care. I will add weight to your final. Like anything you didn't do in your class, it automatically increased the weight of your final. It was like just, so you could have up to 90% of your class grade just on the final. And like 10% was in participation or something, you know? 
But um, man, she was funny. We had I was on, we were in the quarter system to start with, and we had this weird winter quarter that was half before the the uh, Christmas break and half after. It like straddled Christmas break and the quarter system. It was the strangest term, right? So I was taking trigonometry, and it was like Monday, Wednesday, Friday at like nine, which was just I was commuting like thirty five minutes at this point. So I was like, ugh. But she said that if you went and you did the rest of the homework for the semester, she'd let you take the final. So over Christmas break, I like did all of the homework for this class. <laughs> I went back and like I want my final. So I took the final, and then I didn't have to get up Monday, Wednesday, Friday to go to this class. It was great. But when I brought her that stack of homework, I think she looked at me and she said, "You're single, and you live with your parents." <laughs> it's like guilty as charged. <laughs> I'll take my final now. Yeah. <laughs> I got five kids. <laughs> that would have been that would have been a hilarious answer at the time. I like that. I should try that next time. Oh, and I can't take it anymore. I take it already. It'd be fun to go back and take trigonometry now, actually. All right, can I erase? Uh, so let's get out of the way. Okay. 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 You're not like watching soccer or something, right? Soccer. Well, I had a student come to me once, and she said to me, "I said, you know, Patrick, you're not doing well in this class. I think it's because you're, you know, you're texting too much during class. Because he come to the office hours, asked me to reteach the whole lesson again. Like, what? What's the deal, man? Like, you're in class. Like, pay attention. Pay attention. I think I told you this before. And then he told me, what did he tell me? He said, Oh, really? Yeah, so he tells me, he says, oh, no, sir, no, sir, I wasn't texting, I was watching soccer. Watching soccer on my phone. That's, that's next level, right? You guys are not nearly that bold. You're nowhere near that. You're not even approaching that level of whatever that is. Oh, yes. <clears throat> I one like my, my favorite though of all time was like once I was just in the middle of a lecture and all of a sudden this guy in like in the back of the room just swears super loud, just like I won't repeat it. I actually forget what it was, but whatever he said, and then just stormed out of the room. I was like, What? <laughs> he never came back. <laughs> never showed up again. <laughs> that was it. He was gone. <laughs> People do crazy stuff. All right. Example three, um, f of x equals 3x squared plus um, 5x plus 2. So completing the square here is pain because it's got a 3 out front, but we can still do it. We factor 3 out. like so, right? And then proceed like we did before. We take half of the x coefficient, put it together with the x, square it, subtract the square. Um, this would produce an absolute revol revolt in uh, my intermediate algebra. If I do this, they will start complaining about me using fractions. Um, they complain bitterly. Now, you guys are still complaining in your heart, but you have the good sense to not say it out loud. Let's see here. All right. So, um, pointing out, we need to make 36 to like do the next step. So, I'm just looking ahead to what I need to do, which is to convert to 36. So, um, oh man, I wanted this to work out complex. Look at that. Oh well. Is that, yeah, 2 thirds times 12 over 12, which is 1, right? But that's what I need to do to make the common denominator 36 happen, right? And then that give me a 24. Minus 25 is, well, 1. But it's minus 1 because the 25 wins. So I get 1 over 36, which is 1 over 6 squared. Yeah. Oh, this is funny. 
So this is 3 times x plus 5 sixths minus 1 sixth times x plus 5 sixths plus 1 sixth. Can you guys clean that up a little bit? What's 5 minus 1? It's 4, right? What's 4, 6? 4, 6 is 2 thirds, yeah? Five plus one, six. Six over six, one. Multiply through the three. Now some of you might have seen that factoring from the outset, right? Like if you've been taught that slide and divide method or whatever, or the too much. You guys know about slide and divide? No? No. It's probably better for me not to tell you. <laughs> I don't know. It kind of grieves me to teach it. Uh, so if I've got 3x squared plus 5x plus 2, I can rewrite that as 3y squared plus 5x. Excuse me, y squared plus 5y plus 6. And then that is y plus 2 times y plus 3. I think. Did I do that wrong? It's here. Now what? Divide, oh yeah, divide by three. And so the thing is, y is equal to 3x in this substitution. So you get, you know, um, 3x plus 2. Um, and, and technically, I need a, well, Fine. Now you, you've doubtless not been taught to change the letter. They just kept X's and put the number over and then you magically divide by three at the end, right? Yeah. But the truth of the matter is what you're really doing is you're taking F of X and you're multiplying it like Multiply that by a. And then this gives you, if you let y equal to ax, you get g of y equal to y squared plus by plus ca. And so then you can factor that. And when you factor that, what you've actually factored is a times f of x, which is when y you divide by a to get back to f of x. This is the slide and divide method. It's a sneaky way to deal with a leading coefficient, which is not one. You can do it any which way you want. I mean, I, I think, well, I mean, think, I think for quadratics, completing the square is like super easy because the reason I think completing the square is better is because with slide and divide, you're still, I mean, once you understand you can factor the 3 out for completing the square, then at least with completing the square, you know which case you're in when you're, when you're in the middle of doing it, right? Like you're, when you get a minus here, you know you can factor if you get a, in the, over the reals. If you get a plus here, you know you're stuck with a com complex solution or that you can only factor the complexes. I just think completing the square gets you more information as you're going. So, I mean, that's what I prefer. But I think slide and divide has a lot of room for error for students who don't remember it precisely as they were taught it. Because like intermediate algebra is where I just learned it a couple weeks ago. I never heard of this before. And um, so the student who told me about it, they were a good student, right? But they'd already forgotten about 20% of the method, so they couldn't explain it to me. So if you, if you remember it perfectly, then you can use it. It's fine, you know? After all, it just, it's kind of a means to guess the... the what we have at the end here. But there are other tricks, I'm sure. Somebody else said it wasn't called, for them it wasn't called slide divide, it was called the, the too much method or something like that is, <laughs> that's the, the too, like too much on the x squared. So those problems are typically, you just put a two in the front of the x squared to complete the pun. But, all right, I'm gonna erase this. Dr. George, have you graduated up there? I did. 
if you've been here at the start of class, you'd heard about this already. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. It was before class I mentioned it. And, um, and sadly, like I was, so I graded it, and um, like Friday, I graded them Friday, actually. I didn't have a chance to like total the points up yet. And then I put them in my drawer, and I left. And as I was walking up the stairs here, I was like, ah, because I, I should have them for you Friday. I could have them for you tomorrow if you wanted to come pick them up. But. OK, let's move along here. So let's, let's factor completely um, x squared plus um, 3x plus 2 quantity squared times x squared minus 4 um, times x squared plus 5x plus 4, oh, 4x plus 5 rather. All right. So to factor completely, we, what we'd like to do is to factor everything down and combine anything that's like common. This is going to be important for our next, our next uh, <clears throat> topic of interest, which is you know graphing and solving uh, rational functions, right? Like, so first of all, anything that's inside a square, you want to like try to like just factor that to start with. That's x plus one times x plus three plus two, right? So we don't need completing the square if it's something we can just see. So if you can just see it, just factor it. You know, that's always the case. Um, but I've got to square that, right? Now, x squared minus 4, that's the difference of squares. We, we own that. That's x minus 2 times x plus 2. Now, x squared plus 4x plus 5, if you think about 5 times 1 or minus 1 times, you know, you don't have a minus 6. You don't have a 6, so it's not going to factor nicely. Might as well complete the square on this one. And so completing the square on this last one gives me x plus 2 quantity squared. Think about that. That gives me a plus 4. I have a 5 here. So I should either subtract. I should subtract 4 from this, right? But then minus 4 plus 5 is plus 1. Now, if you don't believe me, multiply it out and see that you get back to x squared plus 4x plus 5. All right? Now I've got everything as, as, as simplified as it can be, and now I can try to like group things together. Is there any kind of commonalities here? I mean, when I square this, I get what? So notice that we can... Um, We can put this one and that one together, right? So what we have is x plus 2 cubed times x plus 1 squared times x minus 2 times x plus 2 squared plus 1. And that would be this completely factored over the reals. But if I, mm -hmm. if yeah. you wanted that one in the complex, then what you would have to do it. Right? But if you wanted it in the real, you could put it like that. Yep. But what if I, what if I had said factor over the complexes? How would that change it? Then, yeah, we can take that one and split it, right? To a product of. Minus i. Just like that. Now we're on it. Let's talk about how to graph this polynomial. Right? We've gone to all this work. Let's talk about how to graph it. How would we graph y equals f of x?
What's that? Well, we, we don't really, we don't, <laughs> we did with the complex, it's kind of like, eh. What's that? Find the intercept is a good, uh, good advice. I'll, I'll do the easy intercepts. The x-intercepts, I already can tell you what those are. Right, there's one at minus two. There's another one at minus one. And then there's another one over here at two. Those are my x-intercepts. The x-intercepts we can see from the factorization, right? And the complex factor, this, or this irreducible quadratic, that doesn't, that just kind of makes it bigger or smaller. Well, yeah, oh yeah, very good. So, um, so can I, can I, well, I, want to either, I need to erase this complex. It doesn't really help us graph at all, just kind of in the way at the moment. So notice that the multiplicity, if the, we can say this, if the multiplicity is odd, multiplicity of minus two root is three. Multiplicity of minus one root, or you could say zero if you like, is two. And here, multiplicity of two uh, root is one. One, two, Aw, oh, man. Three. So if the multiplicity is odd, it crosses. If the multiplicity is even, it bounces. So we're going to bounce. We bounce at uh, minus one, but we cross at two and, and minus two. What else can I see? I can see, I figure out the y-intercept, right? How would we figure out the y-intercept? Yeah, put x equal to zero. In other words, we want to calculate what's f of zero equal to. So, I mean, pick your favorite formula here to do it. I think I like this one, actually. If I plug in zero there, I get, you know, two cubed times one squared times minus two times, what happens when you plug in zero to here? We get five. Right. And what is that? I think that's minus 80. So I don't suggest you use the same scale on the y and the x-axis here. Like I definitely don't have enough chalkboard for that. But um, supposing I put my minus 80 here, just for, for, for giggles. Um, so we're, and, and what else do we can, we can know? By the way, f of x is approximately what? It's approximately, what's the order here? This is a quartic, this is a quadratic, this is a quadratic. So 2 plus 2 plus 4 is 8. This is an eighth order polynomial. And so f of x is approximately x to the eighth for um, x much the absolute value of x much, much greater than zero. Like this is a way of thinking about it. The, basically, this is x to the eighth for x really big in either direction, right? So essentially, it just looks like a big one of these guys, right? So we know basically it's going to go like this, right? And like this over here. It crosses at minus two, doesn't it? It crosses at minus two, then it bounces, right? Then it comes down and goes through here, and then actually I don't really know if it does if it does that, or if the minimum is before the y-axis. Like I just don't know without calculus how to figure out where that is. 
if we had calculus, we could take the derivative set it equal to zero. That would tell us where mins and maxes are. We don't, so we can't, right? But how did you say you knew it started? Like well, because it's x to, it's x to the eighth. Like the, the leading term here is x to the eighth. If you multiply this out, the largest thing is x to the eighth. So it, it or you could just plug in any number you like, you know, that was really big and really small. Okay, so next up, because I think we've done a lot of this now, right? But the next thing we want to do is discuss how do you graph something like y equals to 1 over f of x. How, how does that work? Like, what if we just took 1 over this function? Can we still graph it? And the answer is yes, but pretty much the same song and dance. It's just instead of having every place we currently have a 0, we get what's called a vertical asymptote. And then we have to like plug in points and sort of figure out what happens between the vertical asymptotes. And we'll start doing that Friday. But again, the key is factoring your numerator and denominator function. And otherwise, once you know that, it's not bad. Thanks, guys. And of course, you can use a graphing calculator to check your answer if you want. Thank you.